Dr. Keisha Porcher, um, how has the pandemic changed your view on education? Ooh. I don't even think that the the pandemic, to be honest, I feel like gave us an open gate. And I've heard you talk about this to like really turn things into what they should have been, especially in education. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, you heard everybody saying like, we're going to reimagine education. We're going to create something that really works for all students. But as soon as the buildings, the physical buildings, because I feel like schools were always open, but as soon as the physical buildings opened back up and they went back into the physical building, it was all of this conversation about like, let's go back to what we had before. And so I'm questioning all of the folks, like what happened to the reimagination? Like what were we gonna, I thought we were gonna do something different. And so for me to be honest, and I'm gonna be transparent, I started off teaching um, all black students in Prince George's County, shout out to PG. And it was like my heart's work. I loved getting up, going to teach every single day. And so the challenges that I have now as a professor is very different because all of my students are not melanated, right? And so my research was very heavily focused on like, how do we prepare non-melanated teachers to teach black students? And it has been that for like the last three and a half years. And prior to the pandemic, me and my best friend and a close friend, she's a faculty member too, Dr. Charmaine Bertrand, we were at a conference. This was pre-pandemic. And this is when I first started like this journey. Um, one of the facilitators asked us, when you get free, how will you know you're there? And we all mm. sat there and was like, what you talking mm. about? She's like, you know, we're all right, fighting wait, for pause, free. Pause, pause. <laughs> I need, I need, I need everyone to sit in that question. Mm -hmm. When you get free, how do you know you're there? How do you how know? How will you know? She said, because we're spending so much time fighting, 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 fighting. When we get to the end goal, how will you know you're there? If you've never been free before, you don't know what it feels like. You don't know what it's like to experience it. How will you know you're there? And we all sat there like, well, so then she gave us a next assignment to freedom dream. So if you can make schools, whatever you wanted them to be like, educational spaces to be like, whatever you want it to be like, what would it be like? And we journaled, I wanna say for about 10 minutes, music playing, drums. And I sat with that and I said to myself, I mm. said, you know what? Even the work that I thought I was doing to prepare non-melanated teachers to teach Black students, I was still centering whiteness. And I had to take a step back and say, I should really be focusing on what it means to center Blackness. And I had never really thought about that and what it would look like, like tangible. Um, so me and my colleague, we were together and we started talking about it. And I was like, what, what would the classroom look like? You know, when you come in, would it be vibrant colors? Would you have music playing? Would drums be playing? Like would kids be singing, engaging? Like what would it look like? What would students be reading? What would they be learning mm. about? And we just okay. spent time breaking right, it down. Know, let, me, let me just, um, <laughs> we have a couple of people that want to talk to you Chat, about your, okay. your, 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 uh, your Cairo experience, uh, okay. not the one in Egypt, but the baby. <laughs> okay. um, but I want people to, I would love to hear the answer to that. When you're free, how will you know it? And then what are your freedom dreams? I just dropped that in Nubia um, mm. in the chat um, because that's, that's the question that drives me with everything mm. that I do. Because I am free and I know that I'm free. And I, and know, I know exactly why I'm free. Mm -hmm. um, and I know my freedom comes with some restrictions because I'm still in a world that may not see me as such. So I have to navigate their um, inconsistencies and their, you know, racism and all the other roadblocks and their insecurities. I have to navigate that mm -hmm. because when you are free, you're going to automatically challenge the system. I had uh, a conversation with a friend of mine recently, and it was like, you're moving in such a way that in nature, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's physics, right? For every mm -hmm. action, there's an equal and opposite. So the way in which you're moving, you're going to get equal and opposite re reaction. You're going to yep. get that opposition. So you got to expect that. You got to build that into your plan. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm doing this. That means this is going to happen. So I have to now build in, you know, a reaction to that reaction mm -hmm. and, or, or a protection around myself and the things that I'm doing, because that is definitely coming. You're not going to go unmolested as a result, yep. because you're shaking up, you're moving this, you're moving the framework, literally, mm -hmm. there's going to be a reaction. So that freedom dream, 
is a con is the thing that drives me. Like, what does it look like on the other side of this? What does it look like a hundred years from now? That's why I plan in in advance. Yeah. yeah. Like who are the people that are going to pick up the stuff that I'm laying down? So, so tell yeah, me, we, give me one, one nugget of your freedom dream. So me and my colleague, we actually came up with the black gaze framework, G-A-Z-E, um, for teacher education. Cause we're like, okay, we're going to create a freedom dream. What do we want education to look like in this teacher education space? And so we started the first thing that we started with, which is so like in tune with everything that you do. And we use black language because it's just a part of who we are. But the first element that we have is just called honoring the OGs. Like who are the elders and the people who have paved the way for us? And we call it the black print, not the blueprint, but the black print. So who can we study in education who have done this well? Like, and I think there's something for all of us to learn in terms of the educators who came before us, who was doing this work with less constrictions than what we have now. And they were successful with students. How do we study them intentionally? And not even just the famous people, like who are the people or the community pillars that we can study too who have been doing this for a long time like for example who is your who is your vacation bible school teacher like what did he or she do like what were those great things that the ways in which they educated people like back in the house with the people frying chicken in the front like what did they do that kept students engaged that kept students having fun that had joy centered in the classroom how do we honor them and bring that into the classroom is the first thing that we started to study and so we just like our grandparents like people in our community my grandmother I call her the community police my grandmother knew every single person in the hood where we grew up she came to every bus stop to make sure every kid got on the bus you didn't go to the bus she calling your mama and say such and such was not at the bus stop I saw her walk up the street right there is something to learn from her like why is it that no kid ever went like toe-to-toe with my grandma like Miss Bev I ain't going to school no they got their butt right on the school bus right there's something that we can learn from those people too that should be centered into our classroom experiences and I think the second thing that we talked about too in this black gaze framework and this is something that I hear Drew talk about too a lot on this show is like sharing our stories like even me sharing my story about my son being born early black women go through so much on this pregnancy journey but sometimes it's so hush hush we don't have critical conversations about it. So even in the classroom, in what ways are we elevating our experiences? Like what were the ways that we learned best? How do we bring that into the classroom? Because so many times when you're a black teacher, they tell you to turn off your language. You can't dress that way. You can't show up that way. But those stories, those the ways that we embody blackness, they have to be invited into the classroom too. And so we have to be open to sharing our stories about who we are and not being ashamed of it. Like to be proud of the complexity of blackness is so important but I feel like especially when like you said like that opposition when we're still operating in a space that it does not center blackness you're going to have that opposition you're going to say why are you sharing your stories and why we got to hear some, one more thing about some black person no you got to celebrate that so we're really really big on that um, I'm just kind of going through the framework the third thing that we um love to do is we add in preaching points like I think a lot of educational frameworks we talk about all of the challenges we have but we never move to that that big piece that follow through so what are we going to do about it all right so we know we have these challenges how are we going to fix it not that it has to be a quick fix so we have incorporated the black church in there like so what are our three preaching points about a topic that we're we're talking about that we can give people like some tangible things that they can do so people are always saying like hit us up what what should I be doing with my kid over the summer okay do your kid know how to swim you need to te- get them into a swimming lesson <laughs> have you taken them to the library do they have a library card right what free activities are going on in your school like giving them some concrete things that they can do as opposed to making things so large that people can't access it right and those things should be invited into any classroom space um the fourth thing that we do is we call what you doing with your life like so what you read it what you listening what you watch it what you watching in your life that centers blackness that can also be invited into the classroom so me and my girlfriend we got a we got a group chat about p valley right and we i was gonna ask you if p valley was on the list see now hold on dr dr porcher is here um and you can follow her at dr porcher p-o-r-c-h-e-r i called you porsche because nikki porsche spells her name the same way, same way. As, my yeah. husband says that's how you pronounce it but come on y'all they can't barely get portrait right so i just stick the right. portrait okay i'm a right. woods that's pretty right. easy so great. right oh. okay um 
P Valley, I was just writing for Friday because, you know, I have a what to watch list mm -hmm. and there's some ratchet stuff on there. Like I have um, all the Queens men, which are uh, AKA big dicks and, and bad acting. Um, and I watched that because it is like family guy It's so cartoonish that it has me crack. Like it's hilarious. <laughs> the writing is bad. The acting is bad. Like everything I is so horrible. Talk about that, but oh I have my not God. But it's, it it's so bad. It's delicious. It's so bad. It's like, it's so <laughs> stupid and ridiculous that it makes me laugh. Right. So mm -hmm. it's my joy. P yeah. Valley is not that it is, it is good, not. good acting and good, good writing. I mean, it is forcing me to 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 be involved with people I would never be involved with normally. Right. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't know Uncle Clifford in my regular life. I wouldn't know Mercedes. Um, and this season, they have gone away from the one bad actor, the one person that can't act. <laughs> and I didn't believe her at all to yes. focus on Mercedes. Everybody, and, yeah. And Keyshawn and Lil Murder, who we and know, we know, we know a little murder. That but that man, this season and his mm. relationship with Uncle Clifford is is so complex. And he's a complex. Like we're seeing layers, and I'm like, none of these people would I ever know. Mm. But now I I I have compassion and insight that I wouldn't have normally, and that's important. And I, I think, think too, I so those people exist in my family. Like where I oh, grew up. And you got so, an Uncle Clifford in your family? I, I, don't, have Uncle Cli I don't have an Uncle Clifford, but I got a little murder for sure. Um, but understanding, like, I always talk to my colleagues about how much Black people have to give up to be in non-melanated spaces, right? But like when I go home to visit my family, I'm going to the projects. Like that's where they all live, right? So I'm gonna see a, a, a gamut of folks that I'm gonna engage with, right? And so those people have taught me so many things that have made me the great educator that I am, who have taught me how to move through the world, like as my husband would say, with my head on a swivel, right? And so those skills I bring into the spaces, but you would never know that because those things aren't invited into classroom spaces. and we always talk about this in our framework, like all Black people have to be included, not just the respectable ones, the little murders, the Keyshawns, they all have to have an opportunity to be free. Now, their freedom might look different from yours, right? Doesn't make yours right, it might wrong, and vice versa. But I think those are the critical conversations that we have to have in educational spaces. It can't just be the kids who show up with everything organized. They, they say yes every time you ask them a question, they do their homework on time. No, the ones who come in cracking jokes talking about you they gotta go too we have to find a way to reach them too and i don't think we yes. talk enough about that no and let me just say um in addition to that dr porcher um and you have a podcast with somebody dropped in nubia so thank you yes. ra mills and nubia the black gays podcast mm -hmm. um the compassion that you have to have in the the multi-dimensional way like you said you know most art most tv shows you know you got the drug dealer you got the, you know, you got the stripper, you got the, you know, the, the you know, transgendered mm -hmm. guy, you know, and they're like one dimensional and they're like there's neck popping and finger snapping and, you know, they're going to be hitting a pole. But what P Valley has done is give you dimensions and layers like Keyshawn in my cricket letter, cricket letter. I yeah. actually comes from a, a, a well off family? right a well off her father was well off like there there's like you and, and the white boy that she married is abusive and you like you're like oh she's in a situation that many women find themselves in but there's a flip to it and, and there's like an entry point where you can have a heart like mm -hmm. little murder first season I was like eh. <laughs> now I'm like how he Whoa. treated little clipper's grandmother Ernestine took care of her Oh my God, shout out to Loretta Devine who was playing her I mean, one role that she's barely in. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just to me, the kind of compassion we should have for each other, which we don't. We see people on the street. Oh, that person's got their pants sagging. They're a criminal. They got a hoodie mm -hmm. on. That's a, the thug. This person, oh, she's a thought because her booty cheeks are out. But everybody's mm -hmm. got a story, an origin story that is way more than just what we see. That's important. That's so important. I think that's what we need to understand about teaching and learning. It's all about censoring humanity. Listen, I could tell you 
all of my students' stories. And when I see them in the future, it doesn't surprise me, you know, just based on the experiences that we've had. They were great students because I've provided space for them to just be. And I think the one thing that I've learned the most, even with my own family, like I told you how I grew up, is like my job as a teacher is to cultivate your genius. Shout out to Goldie Muhammad. It's not to turn you into who I am. That's not the purpose wow. of educating, right? It's how do I take your gifts, whatever they are, how do I cultivate that in my classroom space? That's what teaching and learning is about. And guess what? If they decide to become a Keyshawn, listen, that's their journey. I've done my part, but it's not for me to say, okay, I want you to have this middle-class lifestyle. I want you to go to college because I always tell people all the time, the reason why I have gotten as far as I have gotten is because I assimilated. And I got to be honest about that, right? Like I was like, okay, you want me to do that? That's what I need to do to get by. But the most brilliant people that I've taught and that I've been in classes with, they were the people who didn't assimilate. And I'm just keeping mm. it 100. Yes, 100. All right, we were talking about a bunch of things. Um, That freedom question that you asked and then how you're framing teaching. Because what people don't know is you teach teachers how to teach us. Yep. That's your job. You teach That's teachers how to teach us. What has been the biggest obstacle? Because we're losing a lot of teachers now. We are. A lot of teachers during this pandemic were like, you know what? I don't get paid enough for this. I don't get paid enough for this. Now y'all want to bring polio into the classroom and monkey pox go ahead with all of this. I'm out. I can go on Google, get, sign up for one of them courses, make twice as much money. That's I could work at Walmart as a manager, make twice as much money. I don't need to do this. So how do you keep teachers engaged? I think for me, the biggest the biggest thing I've been saying is like the pandemic has been like atrocious. I'm gonna just be honest. But the one thing that I've learned about teaching is you have to pivot. Um, not just, you know, when we have a global pandemic, but from class to class, you have to pivot, right? And so I've had some very hard conversations with my students about what they're entering into. And so we do have students who are still like, this is what I want to do. It's what I've always wanted to do. And I'm excited to get started. And so I've really been working with them on flexibility. Like, what does the classroom look like when you can have something that changes where the majority of your students aren't here because they're ill or you are ill and you have to be out like how do you remain nimble in that space and so I had I'm actually teaching a course this fall called L literacy and technology and so the biggest thing that I've been focused on is how do I teach my students now how to prepare for a space like this and I think there were a lot of great things and pedagogical strategies that we adopted when there was remote instruction that should stay inside of the classroom, right? And so what are those things and how should we be exploring that? But I've also been talking to my students very critically about like, how do we define literacy, especially literacy for students now? It doesn't look the way that it looked when we were coming through school, right? And so some of the literacies that we're talking about is hip hop literacy and racial literacy and critical media literacy, right? Because our students are consuming so much and they don't come to us as empty vessels most of our students know how to work laptops better than us know how to do these apps do all these things that we are not aware of and how do we make those things an element of the ways in which we teach like it's so easy to say like well I want it to be the way that it was before but like you have students making more money than teachers on YouTube right how do we keep <laughs> them engaged we have right. to I think about Gracie's Corner I don't know if you're familiar with Gracie's Corner but my son Tell watches me. Gracie's Corner it's a um a YouTube show started by a, a a man and his daughter during COVID. He was he kids are always on YouTube and he noticed that his daughter couldn't find any YouTube videos that had black children in it. So they created Gracie's Corner and they've created all of these different learning songs, counting and alphabet and every song that we learned growing up, they just put it to a hip hop beat or a reggaeton beat. And my son, when I turn on Gracie's Corner, everything in my house stops. He's like and he bobbing his head and he's not even one, right? And so like, how do we create that type of engagement inside of classrooms? So I've been telling my students like, websites don't work anymore. You probably need a YouTube corner now that your students can go to and watch videos of you teaching when they're not present. Like we have to think on our toes and I'm yes. learning too. Like I have a TikTok page teaching my students on TikTok. They all on TikTok all day. I don't like TikTok, it's not my preference, but if they're on TikTok all day, I'm about to create some videos about the content and you gonna when you scroll through your TikTok you're gonna see me on there teaching with my braids and my red lipstick and you're gonna get the education that you need so I think that 
being nimble and pivoting to what our students are actually accessing each day is extremely important. And honestly, it's so much fun when you learn it and it keeps you on your toes to know like teaching ain't about you. It's not about what you loved when you were a teacher. No, it's about accessing the students again, cultivating the people who are in front of you. So what do they love? What do they like? And how do we use that as a springboard to teach them content? Mm. I mean, you said something, a lot of things. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Keisha Porcher. Uh, she also has a podcast that you can check out. Um, uh, tell us the name of it again. Black the, Gaze. The Black, Black Gaze, Gaze podcast. Black, Black G-A-Z-E podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what is literacy? You know, mm. I feel like <laughs> everything we've been taught, first of all, needs to be re-examined, you know, mm -hmm. um, even how we're teaching about the history of this country and the history mm -hmm. of other countries. And we don't teach the history of any other country, even though we, it's all interconnected, but we don't connect the dots for our students. So, but with, then we test them and we're, mm -hmm. we're over, over the top on testing, but you're testing them about things that are, are either irrelevant or not really true. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what is literacy? What does it mean to be literate, to learn, to know things when the system itself needs to be re-examined in terms of what it's teaching. So I always think about this, like when I was coming up and like getting my teaching certification, it was like reading, writing, speaking, your ability to read, write, and speak. And that's just on a very simple, simple level, right? But I grew up with my grandmother. And when I tell y'all my grandmother is one of the smartest people I know, but I didn't find out until I was an adult that my grandmother could not physically read, right? I didn't know that. So my grandmother had this thing with me where it made me feel special. When the mail came, my grandmother would say, Keisha Marie, get my mail and let's sit down and let's read it. And I would read it to my grandmother and tell her, oh, they want you to do this and do that. And then she would say, okay, Keisha Marie, let's practice your penmanship. And I would write out my grandmother's checks. Like, okay, these people, you got to pay them $100. So I was just so proud. Like I get to do, you know, this big girl thing that my other siblings didn't get to do. And then when I got older, my grandmother was like, you know, I never really read well, but I know you always love school. So I use you as a resource. And so when I started to think about literacy, I said, so are you telling me that my grandmother is not literate when she was smart enough to say I got a granddaughter who knows how to read and I can make a game out of this thing right so it's not just about being able to physically read like that is a skill that we want people to have but how do you read the world that you live in my grandmother is like in her almost you know touching 80 at this point and she's been able to move through the world and live a full life so do I say she's not literate because she doesn't know how to read she's learned how to read her world in a different way she's learned how to access resources that's a skill right that most people don't know how to use right so I think that I've had to expand even my idea of, of literacy like there was no thing called critical media literacy when I was getting my teaching certification what is that right but our students access so much media on their phones at the drop of a second how do we teach them how to be critical about what they read like how do they check sources to know if this is true or not like one of my my doc students like she she says like Keisha these kids use TikTok like it's Google like how mm -hmm. do we teach them how to wow. look at a source wow. and say like this is not credible right and I had to sit back and say whoa I don't go to TikTok for anything that I want to know right but these kids do and so we have to be thinking very critically mm -hmm. like hip-hop is a form of literacy for children too how do we how do we incorporate that into a classroom so it's very it has become much more cultural um, than it was previously it's not just about reading writing and speaking and I believe that as we continue on, literacy is going to continue to evolve depending on the, the world that we're living in. Are you optimistic or and and where, because I, I also read a stat that children that live in quote unquote inner cities fell behind several, like at least two grades during the pandemic and probably will never catch up. And they were already because of the lack of access to the internet and other things weren't doing their, you know, uh, virtual learning. But there's another, another, okay, tell me, that my tell me something actually, else. I'm going to drop it like on Twitter when I, uh, when we're done, there's another resource that says that a lot of black students also jumped reading levels during this pandemic. So it's like, who is your source? Right. And then right. what are we using as the barometer? Right. So even when we think about testing and we think about education, it's still center of whiteness. It's based on the achievement of white students. Right. We're not comparing black students to other black students because that's where the real, the real work happens. Right. You 
you hear, I interview, we interview students on our pandemic. I mean, like all throughout the pandemic, we interviewed middle school students, we interviewed teachers, we interviewed high school students. And they said, this is the safest they have ever felt being remote. That is mm. something that we have to look at. They're like, I can, you know, look right to the left and talk to my mama about something that we're, we're, I never had that access. So we can have those conversations. Do I believe that there are some students who are having some challenges due to the pandemic? Absolutely. But there are also some students who flourish in this environment. And those are the things that we need to be studying also too. You even think about black people at work. There are black people who are saying, I don't wanna go back into the office. I didn't feel safe, right? But those aren't, those aren't the articles that we're seeing. It's the learning loss articles that we're seeing about right. all the black children who are behind mm. right and so I'm always looking to see like who wrote this what's their agenda right is it more testing is it more textbook purchases like you gotta you gotta dig deep but I'm not also naive to think that kids aren't struggling and they want that access but we have to learn from all of those spaces we can't just use that one narrative because I want to say I'm going to get the the number incorrect but we've been talking about this in our hbcu chats i'm a graduate of an hbcu hbcu enrollment has skyrocketed during the pandemic right it's so bad they don't even have enough housing for the students that's how i mean it's not bad but that's how good it has been you don't hear anybody talking about that but enrollment at, at predominantly uh white institutions are low right and they're saying oh we're students you know they just don't want to come back but those are the studies we should be looking at like why are all of these students now going to historically black colleges do they feel safer now do they feel like they're going to get a different mm -hmm. education and so i think I, and now when i look at those resources i'm always looking for joy and in what ways is this work center in blackness and is it from an asset perspective not that those things aren't important but how do i make sure like in what ways is blackness being centered and it's humanizing in this particular work that you're putting out. That should be foundational.